Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and the abomina an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendants of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because He is no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does He not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and the wife of your covenant. Did He not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the Lord seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit, and do not be faithless. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied Him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you, will, who you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when He appears? For He is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who op oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who, trust aside, who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Thus far the reading of God's Word this morning. Now, brothers and sisters, you know as well as I do, there are certain texts in the Bible which come up again and again every Christmas season. Uh, and it's not hard to understand why that's the case. You know, we think of Isaiah chapter 7 and chapter 9, uh, the, 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 the forte, the promise of the birth of the child. And then there are the infancy narratives in Matthew and in Luke that we hear every year and enjoy. But then there are also some other texts in Scripture which do not seem to get the same attention at Christmas time, but are indeed... Uh, speaking of that time. Uh, for instance, there's that passage in Matthew chapter 2 about Herod killing the children while Jake, uh, Joseph and Mary flee south to Egypt. Uh, have you ever heard a sermon on that? Another such passage we don't often hear has to be Malachi chapter 3. Now, the context of Malachi's message is important. He lived and preached in a time after the divided kingdom, north and south, and after the exile, and after even the return from the exile. So many generations have passed. The lifetime of Daniel, you remember, has come and gone before the return of the exile occurred. 
Many people were now back in Jerusalem again. They had begun to build new walls for the city, new homes, new farms, new businesses. But they had neglected rebuilding the temple. And they did not come before God with those sincere and thankful hearts that you would think returning exiles would give in order to worship His name. And in this brief message that Malachi has here, Malachi charges his people with complacency. Their attendance to the things of God has grown lazy. And as a result, their worship has grown hypocritical. They had allowed their hearts to drift far away from God. And as a result, they had grown defensive even in their own sinfulness. And they had even grown to resent what they had to do before God in worship and in duty. I'll give you an example of that. In the earlier part of Malachi, they're talking about the worship of the, by way of the ceremonial law. That was now in place. It had been years. The as Israelites had not been able to worship God according to the ceremonial law, which they always wanted to do. Now they were back in Jerusalem, and they could do that again. That was still in effect, but it was as though they saw that worship like that was now a burden. It was too costly. It was too much of a sacrifice. And they looked for ways to actually sell the Lord short. The law, you see, required them to bring spotless lambs in for the sacrifice. Now remember what that lamb stood for. It represented the gift of God in Christ. And they put their, it was like they put their sins on the head of that lamb, and then the lamb was slaughtered, saying, this is how God it regards your sin. It is severe, and it requires death, but it is, the, it is the death of a substitute. And because a lamb cannot pay for a man's sins, it's a substitute by way of symbol. It's a substitute that points to the sacrifice of Christ. They knew the requirements of the law. But instead of spotless animals, they were bringing blind, uh, crippled, defiled animals in, you know, animals that nobody wanted, nobody wanted in their herds. You know, these are the kind of animals, if you remember, Jacob told Laban he would take. And he grew his whole flock from these animals. But they were animals that nobody really did want. They were animals that nobody else would certainly buy. And so when it came to worship, spotless lambs were required. The protests began to come up and rise up in, in Malachi's hearing. What's wrong with bringing a defective animal to worship? It's just going to die. It's just going to be burned up anyway. This way I accomplish two things. I bring my offering to the Lord and I dispense with an animal I can't profit from. Well, that's what we read, read of in chapter 2, verse 17. That complacency finally led to outright rebellion, outright defiance. They denied God's rebuke to them, and they even questioned His very existence. Where is the God of justice? I don't see Him. What's the deal? If He's really there, let Him show Himself. Well, you know, the pure... Obedient, holy worship of God is always a struggle. It's always a tension for God's people. Not just then, but now too. You know, on one hand, when the Spirit of the Lord leads us, we come eagerly. We seek the house of the Lord. We want to be with God's people. We want to worship God. We want to give Him our adoration and our thanksgiving. Uh, we want to meet with the God of all grace. We know we belong here. We know that this is where we should be. Psalm 84 and 96 reminds us, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yea, faints for the courts of the Lord. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory. Do His name 
bring an offering and come into His courts. There's enthusiasm and joy to meet with God in those psalms. But on the other hand, we too will always wrestle with the tendency to grow more complacent and more hypocritical, to be more and more self-satisfied in offering God less and less of ourselves, so there's more to keep for our own desires, to see less and less need for that spiritual fervor, that spiritual zeal, and we hope, we even expect God not to notice when we start slacking off our devotion to Him. You know, the Israelites in Moses' day did the same thing. They didn't want to to worship God as He would prescribe to them in the giving of the ceremonial law. At Mount Sinai, the Lord was intimidating, daunting, holy. Who wanted to be close to that? And so they changed their worship. They changed it to something that suited them. They made a golden calf, an idol, that they wanted as a focal point themselves. Something that satisfied their notion of God enough, but also something that tolerated their own comfortable complacency. They knew in their hearts that the the main reason people acknowledged God but still chose to worship Him as they please is because when people worship only as they please, they permit themselves to live their lives as they please. A God that does not require holiness in worship will not require holiness in the minds and the hearts of the worshipers. That's why Malachi knows that the people will be more than surprised. In fact, he says, you're going to be shocked on that day when the Lord really does appear. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, The Lord to whom you think you seek, the one in whom you think you delight, He will indeed come to you, But you aren't going to like it when He comes. And that's because all along, you see, the people have, they have not conformed their lives to the Word of God. There was no desire to become uh, changed and, and, and to grow closer to the Word of God. Instead, they had conformed the Word of God to their own lives. Shaved off this commandment, dispensed with that requirement, dismiss this issue, embrace something else that they might want. And so the one they think they will welcome will, in reality, not be a welcome sight at all. Instead, Malachi says, he will come to refine and purify, to restore the people of God to righteousness and to holiness. (coughs) And the implication of that, of course, is it such an experience of being in the presence of a most holy God will not be very comfortable at all. But even here, my friends, the the promise is that the holiness of our God and the grace of our God are both to be made manifest on that day. Even when we are faithless, God is faithful. The Lord says He disciplines those He loves. He reproves the ones in whom He takes delight. And it is the Lord's covenant commitment, it's His word to us that keeps His faithless people from being destroyed. The Lord does not change His mind The Lord does not change His word. The Lord does not change His promise. And therefore, God's people are not consumed. God sends His prophet, Malachi, even to these lazy, distracted, hypocritical people, not utterly to to utterly judge and condemn them as they deserve, but to sanctify His people, to cleanse them, that they might be holy and without blemish themselves. 
a bride washed of water in the Word. Now, we know that this prophecy speaks of the coming of Jesus Christ, His advent, His first coming. Because verse 1 speaks so clearly about the messenger who goes ahead of the one to come, preparing the way. That prophecy was, was fulfilled by John the Baptist, of course, who came calling the people not to a simple return to proper methods of worship, but to a proper love for the God they worship. And that requires hearts to be broken over sin. Worship is not just something mechanical that you do no matter what's going on in your heart. Worship of God requires a brokenness over sin. <coughs> hearts made, uh, hearts convicted uh, of the complacency that can lead to defiance. Hearts made repentant of sins by the Holy Spirit rather than defending them. Hearts made ready to truly receive the King when He comes. That reminds us of Jesus' parable of the sower. Excuse me a second. <coughs> you remember the parable of the sower? Or as I call it, the parable of the four soils. The first, the sower scatters the seed. <coughs> The first three seeds all share something in common, whether they fall on a path or they fall uh, on the rocky soil or they fall on the weedy ground. <coughs> <coughs> I've got a tickle I can get rid of all of a sudden. The seed does not, <coughs> <coughs> the seed does not prosper. Uh, the soil does not bear forth fruit. Only the fourth soil will bring forth the harvest. But that soil was not just good on its own. It had to be made good. The soil of the heart must be first tilled by the Holy Spirit if it is to receive the seed <laughs> with joy. <coughs> this is pathetic. The first messenger comes to till the soil. And there is also this other messenger here. The first is the forerunner, but the, but the second is the messenger of the covenant. He is the one who brings God's promise of salvation. He alone will accomplish the redemption for His people, but then the Holy Spirit will apply that redemption, those who have been made holy will then become further sanctified. They'll be made holy unto Him. We could use the language both of Malachi and later of Peter when he says, our dross, our spiritual dross is not just something to be overlooked by God, not just something to be accepted where nobody's perfect. It is to be fired away. It is to be scraped off because God would have you come forth as gold. See, if you had been among the first recipients of this prophecy, how do you think you would have reacted to it? You just heard the words of Malachi. What do you think you would have done? Would Malachi's rather stern words here uh, have been a priority for you? Would, you? would it have got your attention? Would you have said, yeah, I need to address this, I need to concern myself with this in my own spiritual walk? Would you begin to see your own compromises before God? The ways perhaps you've conformed the Lord into something that suits your own wicked heart. You know, Jesus told us the same thing about His second coming. First, there are the words of Jesus' warning he says in Matthew 7, You know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out de demons in your name 
and do many mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Instead of, you know, pondering what Jesus really meant when he said, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me, would you go instead to to be patted on the back, listening to ministers with a very soft and reassuring message for your compromises? Would you only go to worship services where you can be entertained, where professionals do all the performing for you, where you can join with other friends who, like you, don't want to change either, but just meet socially? Would you justify the kind of offering you would bring as being good for you as well? How faithfully are you waiting for Him? Will you welcome Him when He comes again? Well, secondly, how much more earnest is the call of repentance and preparation to be today? If the, if the Spirit of God says that Jesus' first coming as a child is like a refiner's fire, what in the world is going to await Jesus' second coming when He comes to judge the living and the dead? How much more earnest is the call of repentance and preparation today than even in the day of John the Baptist? Today, they know the messenger sent ahead of the king is, it does not come in the form of one single person. There's not going to be another John the Baptist. Rather, it comes in the form of that completed Bible that's in your laps. It comes in the form of the Holy Spirit who opens that word to your understanding. It comes in the form of faithful ministers and preachers who proclaim the word to your hearing. That message is still one of repentance. Because to prepare the way of the Lord still takes work. You know, we're not talking here about the work of bulldozers or tractors moving earth until we literally straighten out our streets. This is the harder calling of the working out of your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who works in you to will and to do to His good purpose. This is the work of loving and trusting the Lord through all things, with all your heart and with all your mind, with all your soul and with all your strength. And the duty of honoring Him and His Word in all of your life and all of your choices and all of your work and all of your pleasure, everything for the glory of God. Leveling those kinds of places, you know, means getting rid of the clutter in your spiritual lives of facing things that war against your soul. You need to admit, for instance, that they are your enemies rather than lying to yourself and saying, oh, they are just my pet sins. But the message today is more than just a call for repentance. It is the even greater invitation to receive the good news. Christ has come. He, the messenger of the covenant, has come to to you. He who paid the price for your soul is coming again for you, to take you to be with Him, so that you may be with Him forever. This is the promise that has been fulfilled. You read about it in the pages of the New Testament. You can trust and rely and depend on its declaration. That is the messenger who has promised you he's coming again. But lastly then, how much more dreadful that day of the Lord will be for those who refuse him. For those who are distracted away from the Lord. When Jesus was born, wise men, you remember, sought Him out to worship Him. Herod the king 
didn't want the competition, so he, went to, he, wanted to, he wanted to kill all the children. He perceived this child to be a threat, and he thought he had the power to destroy him. You know, the world today is chock full of Herods. Many of them are in our Congress. The world today is, is full of those who think they are the ones who finally can bring the truth of Christ to nothing. Finally, it has come to an age when we can shut the Christian church down and we can get rid of the gospel forever. The sinfulness in the heart of man is not changed. Men still seek to destroy the power of Christ. But my friends, breaking the bond of death has put Jesus out of their reach. They can no longer get to Him. He can get to them. The only thing that remains now is for the Lord to come again in justice and in judgment. No man will stand in that day. Every knee shall bow. And don't be confused about that judgment either. Verse 5 in chapter 3 here of Malachi elaborates on this a bit. It says, I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the faithless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner. And do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. You know, Paul, in his letters, lists similar categories, labels, by way of warning. John speaks the same way in Revelation 22. He says, Outside the gates of Jerusalem are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. All ones who will be judged of the Lord won't be judged just by the evil deeds that have been done, but by their clinging to their evil hearts that justify and embrace those acts. Those who would not repent, those who do not seek holiness. The Lord's judgment will be swift. It will be as not a refining fire, but a consuming fire. And it will be against those who reject the Lord and insist on living in unrighteousness, in denial of the Lord's presence, in denial of the Lord's authority, in denial of the Lord's truth. Rebellion against the Lord, my friends, has not changed over the centuries or the millennia. But neither has the holiness of the Lord changed. And Hebrews tells us, reminds us, puts it before us, our God is still a consuming fire. Let's pray together.